Then good morning to you all and also to those connected from home and a welcome to the 15th uh, Buffy lecture on money and finance. We are very pleased to have Professor Nobuhiro Kiyotaki here with us today giving this edition of the lecture. Professor Kiyotaki is a Harold Hen 20 Professor of Economic and Banking at the Princeton University. My name is Elena Carletti, I'm a Professor of Finance at Bocconi University. And I'm particularly happy to be here and have the possibility of introducing Nobu today, as he, I had the privilege of having him as professor at the LSC during my PhD studies, and also even more, the privilege of having him as a member of my PhD committee. Nobu is a macro monetary economist. Broadly speaking, his contribution aims on one end at explaining the fundamentals of money and monetary policy, and on the other at how financial imperfection can amplify macroeconomic fluctuations. Nobu has produced a substantial number of major contributions already from the early stages of his careers. I think it's fine to say that everything he writes becomes a major contribution. During his PhD studies at the Harvard University, he wrote a thesis on the macroeconomics of monopolistic competition, in which he demonstrated the importance of monopolistic competition for the aggregate demand multiplier. And even now, the new Keynesian model still used by central banks owe their existence to this work that he did also together with Oliver Blanchard. Afterwards, Nobu started questioning the, the Keynesian macroeconomic framework with general equilibrium models with the representative agents and sticky prices. And together with Randall Wright, he started then exploring the importance of the interaction between liquidity, asset prices, and business cycle and produce a number of key contributions on the foundation of monetary policy, among which let me just mention two, on money as a medium of change, published in the Journal of Political Economy in 1989, and the Search Theoretical Approach to Monetary Economics, published in the American Economic Review in 1993. And this latter one is better known more commonly as the Kyotaki Wright model. In the mid-90s, Nobu spent a few years at the LSE, and this is when I had the privilege of meeting him, and there he met John Moore. And with him, he started exploring how small shocks to the economy, meaning shocks to technology, income distribution, and liquidity, may be amplified into large output fluctuations due to financial frictions and how monetary policy could smooth these fluctuations. And this work proved the existence of a new amplifying effect, new relative to the one found by Bernanke and Gertler in particular, due to the double condition of the asset, in particular capital, as a factor of production and collateral against possible loan defaults. This research culminated in, an, in another series of major contributions, in particular credit cycle that was published in Journal of Political Economy in 97. And this is better known as the Kyotaki Mua model, and also more recently, liquidity, business cycles, and monetary policy that was published still again in the Journal of Political Economy in 2019. More recently, Nobu has produced a number of papers where he has introduced banks and financial stability into macroeconomic models, together with Mark Ertler and others. And I understand that this is something he has always wanted to do already since his PhD studies, and finally he managed to do, he had the way, he found a way of doing it. And again, a number of contributions came out that are major in the literature. First, Banking Liquidity and Bank Runs in an Infinite Horizon Economy, again published in the American Economic Review in 2015, and the Macroeconomic Model with Financial Panics, published in the Review Economic Studies last year. Nobu is one of the deepest thinkers in the profession, and I, I hope I show to you that his papers are cornerstone of macro and monetary economics. I could not count the total number of citations of Nobu, but only the Kyotaki and Moore model has more than 9,000 citations in Google Scholar. Not surprisingly, Nobu has received a number of important prizes in his long career. Just to mention a few, the Stephen Ross Prize in Financial Economics in 2020, the Bank de France Toulouse School of Economics Senior Prize in Monetary Economic and Finance, and his name is often mentioned among the potential future winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics. Importantly, earlier this year in May, Nobu was awarded the BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award in Economics, Finance, and Management, together with Ben Bernard, Mark Gertler, and John Moore, for their fundamental contributions to our understanding of how financial imperfections can amplify macroeconomic fluctuations 
and generate deep macroeconomics recession. This award is often considered a prelude to the Nobel. And this year, in 2021, three of the six Nobel Prize in Economic Science, Medicine, and Physics were previous recipients of this grant. On this note, let me stop. Let me give the floor to Nobu and for his lecture. And let me thank again him for being here today. The lecture is entitled Horizon of Credit. And I understand we have time until 12.30. Please. Thank you very much for having me here. It is honor and uh, pleasure for me to give this uh, prestigious uh, Power of Buffy lecture today. And many of the insights in this lecture are based on my ongoing joint work with John Moore um, for the last 30 years and uh, with uh, Shen Xinzan uh, last uh, 10 years. And uh, so the title of the talk is uh, Horizons of Credit. And uh, what's the questions uh, to finance investment uh, many businesses raise the uh, external funds uh, against the collateral assets, like uh, fixed assets, like buildings, real estate, and also against the uh, future cash flow. And uh, recently, the more and more assets of the business becomes intangible, uh, borrowing against the cash flow becomes more, more and more important. According to Lian and Ma's recent paper, uh, in US, uh, about 80% of borrowing, corporate borrowing, is now against the future cash flow, and 20% against the collateral assets. And uh, they further examined the wrong covenant, uh, debt covenant, and uh, they find out the amount uh, they can, the corporate can raise funds is about three to four and a half years worth of the gross profit. So three quarters of the uh, borrowing is limited by uh, four and a half years worth of the gross profit, sometimes called the EBITDA. EBITDA is earning before interest, tax, uh, depreciation, and amortizations. And uh, so when you think about the three to four and a half years worth of gross profit, it looks a uh, little low relative to the uh, duration of the business. And moreover, the, when the lender uh, examine how to, uh, they seem to care about the plan of the borrower for the next few years, not, not the long term. Actually, the, because of the EBITDA past, is only useful to predict the next few years of the business, not long term. And uh, when you think about also the, instead of debt finance, the equity finance, again, the equity finance, uh, equity holder seems to care mostly about the near term. Uh, revenue, like uh, the typical stock analyst provides the uh, forecast of next five years, earning forecast. And so, irrespective of equity finance or debt finance, they seem to uh, care mostly about the near-term revenue, and they seem to borrow or lend <laughs> against the near-term revenue. And uh, why is that? Uh, even if the business is long term, uh, they, they lend against the near term. Uh, so, so that's the question. And the typical answer is uncertainty. Because of the, after a few years, a lot of things are uncertain. And, uh, and maybe they, they might default. And uh, so, so you want to, so that's the standard answer. But the, when you think about the uncertainty, uh, the large part of the uncertainty is idiosyncratic uncertainty. Idiosyncratic uncertainty of the corporate is order of magnitude bigger than aggregate uncertainty. And also, idiosyncratic uncertainty is easy to uh, diversify by holding the mutual funds of bonds and stocks, as well as let Banker lending to many business instead of just a few. So, so the uncertainty doesn't seem to be the good answer to explain the 
short horizon of external financiers. And so we try to develop the framework uh, to think about it, basically the, based on the intangible investment model instead of the uh, like a tangible capital model. And, and uh, once we derive the framework, then we use this framework to understand the, uh, the effect of monetary policy. One is the effect of persistent fall of the interest rate. This is uh, motivated by recent experience of Japan. Uh, like uh, We have a low real interest rate for a long time, actually, last 20 years. And uh, despite of that, uh, Japan failed to regain the robust growth. And uh, so a lot of uh, people are worrying about uh, what's wrong about this. <laughs> and the other question is more like a business cycle type monetary policy effect. A typical time span of monetary policy is a few years, uh, not uh, permanent. So, so we kind of want to use this framework to understand the uh, effect of interest rate policy, persistent one as well as more cyclical one. And uh, so let's go to the framework. I more like uh, uh, applied theory. So please put up with me uh, to go for the little bit of theoretical aspect. But uh, you will see how uh, it applied to the practical policy questions. So think about the situation like uh, some people have a technology, but not enough funds. Uh, we call it entrepreneur or engineer. <laughs> and then there are a group of people who have a uh, Lots of funds, but not technology. We call it the saver. And uh, uh, investment technology is using goods as well as a building uh, to pro uh, construct a plant in inside the building. So building becomes a plant uh, after investment. At the same time, through this investment, the engineer acquires the capacity uh, to maintain this building, production facilities, uh, and uh, uh, to be productive. So this is the role of the human capital and the intangible cap investment uh, we are going to focus. And, and then in order to finance, uh, because of engineers don't have enough money, in order to finance the investment, uh, they sell the ownership of the plant to the saver who have a money. And that this you can think of as the equity financing. So you sell the ownership of the plant to the uh, saver. And uh, many of the finance is the debt financing. So how to think about debt financing? Uh, debt financing, you can think the, like a uh, owner still owns uh, uh, facilities. But the creditor worry about if owner default, they have to take over the control of the assets, and uh, therefore they become effectively the shareholder or owner of the building or the uh, plant. So, so in this sense, the debt finance is like a contingent equity finance. So, you, as long as not default, the owner is a, uh, the debtor. But as soon as they default, the creditor becomes owner. And then this kind of equity finance type uh, consideration starts kicking in. So, so we use the equity finance as a baseline. And, uh, and uh, we will discuss the uh, difference later on. Uh, OK, so, the, so then they sell the, the engineer is going to sell the ownership of the plant to the uh, saver, but they cannot sell the human capital to the outside people. Basically, you cannot sell <laughs> the human capital. You cannot enslave, basically. And uh, so, so as a result, the, and nonetheless, this human capital is essential for going to continue in the business. So basically, the, the engineer's human capital maintenance capacity is essential to continuing the uh, business. And if the 
engineer keep maintaining output will come out, yt plus 1, yt plus 2, and so on. But if the engineer stop working, uh, then, then the output stop coming forever. So once you miss the maintenance, uh, period T disappears after that. So that's the, uh, the maintenance technology we are going to think. And the key friction is because of the maintenance is provided by an uh, engineer who is a human, he cannot, uh, she cannot uh, commit to uh, provide a maintenance service unless paid every period. And uh, she actually can work for other plant too later on. Or plant owner <laughs> can hire other engineer to maintain. But the, so this is the uh, key frictions. They, they cannot pre-commit. Engineer at the time of the investment, the investment will generate the plant as well as maintenance capacity, but engineer cannot pre-commit to provide a maintenance service in future. And uh, so uh, what's the value to the society? Value to the society is the present value of output. Uh, so yt plus 1, yt plus 2. This, this output, you can think of the uh, earning. Like that. And, uh, and uh, what is the owner's value? The, the people who bought the, uh, the plant and the shareholder's value. That's the output minus the payment wage to the engineers. So that's the profit. So present value of profit is the, uh, the value for the shareholders. And you can think of this as the uh, present value of tomorrow's uh, uh, profit, yt plus 1 minus wt plus 1, and to uh, continue to own. That's the continuation value, yt plus 1. And, uh, and uh, remember this wage we call is not the usual uh, wage to the uh, regular workers. It's a, a payment to the key personnel who have a technology to maintain the uh, productivity of the business. And uh, so you can think of this as a, a payment to bonus payment <laughs> to the key personnel, like a chief engineer or hired manager, <coughs> or even founder who sold the, uh, the business uh, the equity uh, to the uh, outside shareholders. OK, what, how the, this uh, uh, wage is determined? That's the key part of the uh, model. And uh, so we are going to think, like uh, every period, the, the plant owner and the engineer is bilaterally matched, and uh, they are going to negotiate over the, uh, the wage, how much the, the, uh, the engineer is going to receive the wage. And uh, think about the uh, stake. The stake to the owner is actually franchise value, because of if the engineer don't maintain, the future productivity is gone, so forever. So the stake to the, uh, the owner is the franchise itself. But for the stake to the engineer is you, the wage of this period, because of next period, she can work for some other uh, plant, and uh, she doesn't lose that opportunity. And as a result, you bargain uh, with this surplus, the one is the franchise value, the other is the wage. Uh, the, according to, say, Nash equilibrium, uh, with bargaining power, say, theta versus one minus theta, actually, we can show the wage the uh, engineer is going to receive is a one minus theta fraction of the continuation value. Basically, the engineer knows without his her service, the plant stops, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, she said, without me, it will disappear. So I want the one minus some share, one minus theta fraction of the share uh, for me, my wage this period. This is a wage every period. So it, 
you can think of this as a stock option of the, the key, 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 key member of the uh, business. And uh, that means the owner, <laughs> plant owner, retains only theta fraction of the business value. So because of the one minus theta fraction is gone to the, uh, the engineer. So if you think about the wage, which is a one minus theta fraction of the uh, continuation value, with t plus one, then it means the uh, today's uh, franchise value is the tomorrow's output plus the theta fraction of continuation value because of the one minus theta fraction is as uh, paid as a stock option to the uh, engineer. So if you use this framework, then you can see the present value of the uh, this uh, owner uh, plant is the present value of tomorrow's output two days later, but the fact uh, theta. Uh, R is actually one plus interest rate, uh, real interest rate, and uh, we are going to ignore the uncertainty, so this is the uh, real interest rate. So then two periods later, T plus three, three periods later, the shrinks by factor theta square, and the so on. So you can see the theta is less than one, it's quickly going down. Uh, like a downhill. So you can see the, out the own plant owner or the shareholder value the, uh, the business, mainly near, near term revenue. It's like a 10 years later, it becomes negligible. So you have to derive the value from near term, say, first five years. <laughs> That's why uh, shareholder care about the near term revenue. And also when investing agents, uh, engineer, sell the equity to finance investment, they can raise fund against the near term uh, revenue. And uh, this looks like a, it's getting smaller and smaller. So you might say, what? so is it the profit is going down or is it the, uh, uh, the, in order to understand, let's look at the little picture. So this is the situation which the, uh, the, the output or revenue is more or less constant over time. And also, when you look at the share of the uh, owners, actually, because of its quick, its declining theta, theta square, theta cubic, uh, you see the, uh, the value of the owner uh, or the shareholder uh, is the present value of A, B, C, and uh, this triangle part. So, okay, <laughs> it's okay. So, so you see the A, B, C, and uh, this triangle, uh, that's the, uh, the, the owner's share. Above that is the engineer's share. And uh, so you can see, like, a, it looks like an owner's share is shrinking. The engineer's share is expanding. But the next period happens, so they T prime. The uh, business is already maintained. The, and actually, the owner already paid the engineer uh, in the past. So that part is actually uh, sunk cost. So if you look at the, the here, it's again start similar situations. So today's output is yt prime. And then the owner is getting value uh, a prime, b prime, c prime below that line. So every period, things are moving forward. And actually, the, uh, the productivity maintained at that point is already history. And also, wage paid in the past is a sunk cost. And actually, A prime, B prime, C prime, C, B, A, this little part uh, is actually the, uh, the wage 
in the past, uh, corresponding to contribution to future, but it's already paid in the past. Therefore, owner's point of view, it's a sunk cost. That's why uh, the continuation value doesn't drop. And the, on the surface, the uh, profit doesn't change much. Y minus W is more or less constant. And, uh, that, and uh, as long as the present value of profit exceeds the liquidation cost, uh, they are happy to continue. That's why, despite of the, the shareholders, owner gets the return, derives the value mostly from near-term revenue, uh, the, the, uh, they want to continue uh, as long as the value exceeds the liquidation value. So you may say, okay, but uh, is it uh, due to the, uh, the arbitrarily strong bargaining power of engineer? And is it just uh, the near time, nearsightedness of the owners come from the uh, the too strong bargaining power of the shareholder, uh, the engineers? Answer is no. Actually, the, if we have a, a technology, sorry, technology like this. So this is the production technology, which the uh, tomorrow's productivity Z prime is a function of today's productivity, as well as the uh, engineering input H. So if we think about the uh, the productivity is uh, endogenous, and the results of intangible investment, engineers intangible effort. And uh, if you have a production function like this, this uh, I got the inspired from the uh, Ben Vameox, <laughs> Austrians. Uh, the Japanese education, you read the old books, <laughs> actually. The, I end up reading the, this old book, actually, the, when I was undergraduate student. And, uh, and uh, one thing I learned is the capital. Uh, do you know the, where the name capital come from? Capital is come from the head. So it's the same as the per capita. <laughs> and actually, the it's a meaning is the head to earn the interest or the return is called the capital. So, so this one applied the not the physical capital for instead the intangible capital. And the Z is the today's productivity, intangible capital. And the adding together with today's investment age, you get the tomorrow's intangible capital. If you have an intangible capital investment technology like this, uh, actually the, we can show the wage in the bargaining is exactly the same as the contribution of the today's uh, engineer's input to the future. So, so tomorrow's uh, the today's age go up, tomorrow's z go up, and by elasticity one minus theta. So that's the present value of the marginal product. But the, once z t plus one go up uh, by five elasticity one minus theta, the day after tomorrow's the productivity go up by elasticity theta. <laughs> so this is uh, like a long line impact. Today's the, uh, the engineering input affect the future productivity uh, through this uh, roundabout technology. And actually the uh, bargaining outcome is equivalent to the competitive equilibrium outcome. Uh, because of the wage the, of the engineer is exactly the same as present value of marginal product of engineering input. Uh, and uh, so we can think about this as the uh, basically the, like an uh, outcome of competition, perfect competitions. Uh, and the previously it's a bilateral match, uh, but here you can say any time you can hire any number of engineers. And uh, that's uh, this. Uh, the both give you the same answer. But once you realize the production function is like this, and uh, you can see the why plant owner uh, derives the value from near term revenue, because of the, you can see that today's productivity affects tomorrow's 
productivity, but the say the elasticity, and uh, less than that, you become going down. So you see the uh, the reason uh, the the sorry uh, shareholders the the value is derived from near term is uh, they are on the today's pro plant, but the productivity in future is uh, are mostly due to the cumulative effort of the engineers. Therefore, their influence on pre today's owners' influence is declining, and their contribution to the future is declining. That's why the uh, the borrow the uh, the borrowing is near term, and the plant owner derives the value uh, from uh, near t near future revenue. Uh, reflecting the declining uh, impact of the initial productivities. And so that's the, uh, the answer to the why the credit horizon is short. Uh, external financiers horizon is short despite of a project or business is continuing for a long time. And uh, what's unique about this and uh, you might say, okay, so so that's rationalizing some uh, the short termism of manager or like a, why they, the owner can derive the value on this near term revenue. But the, what's the implications and the, where is the uh, distortions? And the, uh, before going that, let's give you some empirical uh, the support of my, my theory. So. Horizontally, uh, we are looking at the knowledge capital share. This is the Peters and Taylor's uh, data uh, provided by ULMR. And uh, basically, the knowledge capital is a, cumula a, a capitalized value of R&D investment. And how important is R&D capital relative to the total capital stock? It's gone from zero to 0.4 or something, and uh, some of them looks like a negative. And uh, I asked Yuelan why, how come it can be negative? And she said it's actually you the cross business cross farm data is very noisy. So you want to control the like a year fixed effect and also farm size effect. If you exclude this fixed effect. Some of them is negative, so you can see the bunch of them don't have a too much R and D investment. And the vertical axis is the maximum debt to EBITDA ratio uh, coming from debt covenant. You can see the the this is more like a traditional around zero is a traditional industry which doesn't have a too much R and D going on, and uh, and the traditional farms. And uh, their debt to EBITDA ratio at maximum is a little over four years. So, like uh, while the sum of the uh, farm, which is this is a bean scatter plot, so every five percentage categories, and the highest one is over forty percent, and their uh, debt to uh, maximum debt to EBITDA ratio is uh, lower. It's like a three and a, uh, three point two years. So you can see the it's scattered between three to four and a half. And uh, and uh, this is the uh, farm level data. And uh, Yuelan provided me also the industry level data. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. So this is the industry level data, and uh, she called it the design cost share. And the design cost means the cost of R and D investment, and also a uh, lot of uh, customized computer programming and the software, and also like uh, even including the management consulting fees. And uh, so this is a broader version definition of the intangible uh, investment. And the intangible investment in some industry is very intensive. 
Some of them are negligible. You can see the, this top end, the intangible investment cost share is uh, close to 30%. And uh, you can see again, the, uh, the higher the intangible investment and, uh, and the borrowing limit is tighter. <laughs> and uh, corresponding to our technology, uh, this is corresponding to one minus theta. So one minus theta is zero. That's the traditional industry in that level investment is not important. While one minus theta is big, <laughs> the, it's, uh, the, the intangible investment is big. And there, the industry uh, borrowing capacity is more near term. Theta is small. They derive the value near term revenue. So this is the and the credit rising is short. And so that's the implication of the uh, credit horizon. But the, where is the distortion? That's questions. What's the problem of short-term credit horizon? So far, it comes from technology or marketing, and uh, it looks like uh, it's not the problem. The problem arises because of the engineer who have an investment opportunity may not be able to raise enough funds. And here, the, let's write it down, the technology more uh, specifically. Think about the investment technology. I said the goods and building. So suppose that you use X unit of goods, funds, and also Y unit of building to produce the Y unit of plant and the initial productivity Z equal one. And also, engineer acquires the capacity H equal one. So they just uh, get the human capital one unit. And uh, after investment, what is the production uh, look like? The productivity Z plant, uh, plant level productivity Z, hiring the H unit of engineer, then output is uh, proportional to plant level productivity Z times the aggregate productivity A. But the plant productivity next period is that this uh, roundabout of Douglas function, which is T to the theta and the H to the one minus theta. And when you look at the, this technology, you can see the initial productivity is one and the, the human capital acquired through the investment is one. So it means the, you got the exactly the uh, maintenance capacity through the investment, which enable the plant productivity, stay the same productivity. Basically, the, you got the maintenance technology to maintain the productivity at the initial level. And uh, where the building come from, uh, we assume the, the building has alternative use, like uh, for residential purpose or something. And uh, you can use the building to get the uh, F unit of the goods every period in terms of consumption goods. That means the price of the building is the present value of alternative use, residential use. And uh, of course, the case like uh, F to the alternative use depend upon size. And uh, then we will get the more productive use, uh, the use for production uh, building. Uh, the residential space is small, and the uh, rent may go up. And uh, that one we discussed in uh, credit cycle paper. So, so today, we just uh, look at the elastic supply of the building. Uh, with constant opportunity cost F. Okay, so then what is the equilibrium look like? I told you the well, through the investment they acquire H equal one, and also initial productivity is Z equal one. Therefore, it's fully used and the no plant shut down. Actually, the tomorrow's productivity is the same as today's product. Uh, today's initial productivity. So simple case is the uh, all the plant is maintained fully at the initial productivity level. Then uh, that turns out to be equilibrium as long as the alternative use 
is uh, not too exp uh, f is smaller than uh, the critical level. So, so the residential needs is not too huge, and the alternative use is not too uh, productive. Actually, the older plant uh, continues. When you might say, if it's the other way around, what happens? And please look at the uh, the lecture uh, a little bit. But uh, let's co focus on the main case. The continuing uh, every plant continues and the productivity is stay constant. Then, what is the value of the plant? It's uh, pr farm specific productivity is one which means the output is A, right? So, so, and then continues. So therefore, the plant value, which is A uh, to the product present value next period, and the next period is theta A, it's present value. And the next next is the theta square. Oh. So, so that's the value of the plant, and uh, that's the, uh, the, uh, the fund the engineer can uh, raise fund by selling the ownership of the plant to the outside shareholders. But the society's value is the present value of entire output. And then we do see the gap because of the importance of intangible investment. And the intangible <laughs> investment, you cannot borrow against it. So, so the, therefore, in that case, you can have a situation which the, the Investment cost, the goods cost X plus the uh, building cost Q is smaller than the society's value U, present value of total output, so that the disinvestment is viable. Uh, society wants to invest, but the borrowing capacity, fundraising capacity of engineer is less than uh, investment cost. So this is the situation <laughs> which the financing constraint arises. So despite of investment is productive, uh, the, you cannot uh, borrow 100% the cost. And uh, in that case, the gap between the investment cost, goods cost plus building cost, and uh, how much the, they can raise fund externally, uh, the gap you have to finance from your own fund net worth. So in that case, engineer's investment is going to be determined by ratio of the net worth relative to the down payment you need. So this is the uh, investment function uh, when the engineer is facing the financing constraint. Basically, the near termism or the, the, the engineer, the, uh, the owner derived the value on the near term, near future revenue by itself is not the problem, but the ex ante, because of they can, they can raise fund against the near term revenue, the borrowing is not enough to cover the investment cost. As a result, investment is too small, is the uh, distortion we have. And then you might say, wait a minute, uh, we have a lot of borrowing constraint model. You, you produce what? some of them, and uh, what's unique about this uh, uh, credit horizons. And in order to understand, let's look at the impact of the, uh, where the <laughs> credit horizon enters. So as we discussed, uh, the owner, the outside shareholder, derived the value from near term, near horizon revenues. While the, when you look at the buildings, like a building is the lasting for a long time. And uh, in Rome, there are a lot of Roman buildings. It lasts uh, like uh, 2,000 years or more. So, so you see the, the building's duration is longer, like uh, 2,000 years. While the duration of the borrowing <laughs> or shareholder is shorter. It's like uh, five years. And therefore, there is a duration gap. And uh, when you have a uh, Japan-like situation, interest rate is persistently low. Suppose interest rate drops persistently uh, forever. What happened is the, uh, because of the building 
it has a longer duration than uh, borrowing capacity or shareholders value, uh, you can have a situation like uh, borrowing capacity go up, but not much, because of its short duration, five years, while the building value shoots up because of the, its a longer duration. And then you can have a situation like cost of investment go up, and the borrowing capacity, fundraising capacity, fail to catch up. As a result, despite of the low interest rate, investment may go down. Uh, which is unusual, but uh, when you think about the housing market recently, you see that kind of situation, like a uh, uh, housing market, like uh, when interest rate is persistently low, housing price is high. <laughs> but uh, for the first time buyer, borrowing capacity may not go up as much as the housing price, then the first time buyer had a hard time to enter into the housing market, like a youngster had a hard time to buy the house because of the borrowing capacity failed to catch up with the rising investment cost. And of course, the old timer is smiling quietly because of they enjoy the capital gain. So net worth go up to value of the property go up. So this is the uh, impulse response of the, say, period five, the interest rate permanently drops forever. So then what happened to the investment? Actually, the investment shoots up. Partly the price of property is expensive and <laughs> become expensive and the net worth go up. This is something uh, John and I emphasize in credit cycle. So net worth is very sensitive to the uh, value of the asset. <laughs> So value of assets go up, net worth go up a lot due to the leverage effect. And uh, so you do see the spike. And, uh, and uh, everybody is happier. So like the consumption is going up because of the wealth uh, evaluation go up too. And, uh, and because of investment is bigger, output starts growing faster here. And, uh, and and also, this is small open economy, and actually the borrowing from foreigner also go up too. But the problem is the uh, investment is, uh, the investing engineer, uh, the borrowing capacity failed to catch up with the rising investment cost. So investment in the long run starts stagnating. And the uh, investment is the engine of the growth here. Uh, investment creates the plant as well as maintenance capacity, human capital, to maintain this productivity. So what happened is, the, despite of initial boom, it doesn't last forever. The, it enter into the growth path is slower growth than the previous path. Therefore, uh, despite of initial booms, it, uh, enter, economy enter into the persistent uh, stagnations. And uh, it looks like a bubble, but uh, we are saying, I don't uh, ignore the possibility of the importance of the bubble, but here, uh, capital gain creates the uh, investment boom and consumption boom, but uh, if the, the the borrowing capacity failed to catch up with the increasing uh, investment cost. Economy can enter into the long run stagnation. And uh, this is more serious than bursting bubble because of bursting bubble, you may be able to adjust in new situation to recover the original equilibrium. Here, economy stay into the low growth path instead of to go back to the normal. So that's the uh, implication of the credit horizon. And uh, so, but uh, wait a second, uh, usually the interest rate go down is a uh, good news. So how come uh, you can have a, a low interest rate is leading the stagnations? And uh, so in order, ah, before going that, I should say also the policy. So you are a policy maker, okay, low interest rate, is a bad news, then what else you can do? And uh, so the policy-wise, 
the one policy uh, we thought is the, the problem of this financing constraint, short-term credit horizon, is the engineer cannot commit to provide the, uh, the service unless get paid every period. So, and the engineer is basically can switch the uh, different plant, and it's not easy to chase the engineers. So the engineer can need to get paid every period. And uh, in that case, so it's almost uh, like a trading history of engineer is on, it's almost impossible to keep track. And, uh, but uh, when you look at the plant, plant doesn't move around. Engineer can move around, but plant doesn't move around. So government can tax the chase the plant owner and uh, ta tax the payroll <laughs> of the engineer at the uh, rate, say, time. And uh, so even if the engineer is not easy to keep track, but the plant, you can keep track, then tax the plant owner for the uh, payroll uh, and they use this payroll to subsidize investment, then actually the down payment is no longer X investment cost plus Q. Actually, the, after subsidy, the investment cost is the goods cost, building cost minus subsidy. And uh, so therefore down payment is going down. And despite of the wages going down and the engineer's net worth may go down, this will actually stimulate the economy. And uh, actually, you can increase the growth rate and also you can increase everyone's the utility because of the growth effect tends to have a dominant impact on utility in the long run. And uh, why it works? It's because the Government is acting like a creditor. So they give the subsidy to engineer, but later on, they try to get some money back by taxation on the, uh, the payroll. And uh, so, so if you do that, then you can actually uh, stimulate investment by reducing the investment, uh, reducing the down payment. <laughs> And uh, so that's the policy. Of course, the, this requires the government uh, have a power to keep track to every plant's uh, payroll and for the engineer. And uh, if plant owner can hire engineer behind the back of the government, then you cannot do this. And uh, so, so in this sense, the government need the power. But if you cannot do this kind of uh, sophisticated uh, the payroll tax, then government have to rely on more traditional, like uh, uh, providing the education or uh, subsidy for basic research and that sort of uh, law. But uh, this is one possibility of the policy. And uh, let's go back to the uh, business cycle style uh, stuff. And uh, okay. So this is the, uh, the, we talk about the persistent drop of interest rate. Now, more like a monetary policy, let's have an interest rate drop, but not the permanent. So this is the interest rate is lower for say next five years uh, before going up <laughs> next five years and then, then go up and down. So instead of doing the uh, computer things, this is slightly artistic, but <laughs> more or less right. <laughs> and, uh, so what, what happened? Uh, basically, the uh, borrowing capacity or the plant owner's uh, variation, uh, shareholder's variation of plant, is de depend upon the five-year interest rate. So because of the duration is near term, so they derive the value uh, mostly from near-term revenue. So interest rate for borrowing or fundraising external fund relevant is like a five-year interest rate. And uh, since five-year interest rate is lower, <laughs> their borrowing capacity go up. While the building, what matter is the 30-year interest rate or even 
thousand year <laughs> interest rate. And uh, so if the building's duration uh, is long and the uh, interest rate is up and down, and the 30-year interest rate doesn't move as much as five-year interest rate, actually the building value doesn't go up as much because of the, for building value, what matter is the 30-year interest rate, not the five-year interest rate. And then you can see the borrowing capacity go up, but the investment cost, building cost, doesn't go up as much. They, they can invest more. As a result, investment is going high, and the economy starts booming. And, I, and then you might say, wait a minute, you said something opposite <laughs> before, like a low interest rate, the, the uh, building price go up more than uh, borrowing capacity because a building has a longer duration. And uh, this is differences coming from duration of the interest rate movement. If interest rate drop is five years, <laughs> and then five year interest rate falls more than long term 30 year interest rate, then the building price is more stable than borrowing capacity because of borrowing capacity will mostly depend upon five year interest rate. And uh, so if the interest rate drops is more persistent like this, so it's like an interest rate drops for the next 20 years, <laughs> like Japan, uh, and then uh, the investment cost, the Q, the building price, is going up more than the borrowing capacity. This is the, so, so you can see the long-term low persistent interest rate, like an extreme version of quantitative easing, like a drop interest rate, not just short-term, but the long-term, like a 30-year interest rate. And then you do see the investment cost go up more than borrowing capacity because of investment, part of the investment cost is property, which is the longer duration than the borrowing capacity. So, so that case, the permanent drop of interest rate can backfire <laughs> and, uh, and the investment costs go up more than borrowing capacity due to the shorter duration of the borrowing capacity or plant value and the uh, economy can stagnate. While the, if you have a normal five-year uh, interest rate drops, then the borrowing capacity go up because of relevant five-year interest rate go down. While the building, it's 30 year, doesn't move much. So, so as a result, it's stimulating. So this is more like a normal, uh, like a business cycle type uh, monetary policy, which you, you are familiar with. So short, medium term, lower interest rates stimulate the economy. But long term, interest rate drop can backfire. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, to enter into the uh, discouraged investment because of borrowing capacity failed to catch up. So that's the, uh, so the, the perspective you can get from the uh, credit horizons. And, uh, but the more, more elaborate, the careful analysis is needed to the policy analysis. And uh, uh, that could be a, that will be a, topic of the future research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this most interesting lecture. Let me now open the floor. I understand that we take questions from here, and then eventually we go to the questions through the web. So who would like to start? Yeah, Jen. I actually have two questions. I don't know whether they are allowed or not. Uh, the first is on, uh, on uh, the interest rates. You show that a fall in the interest rate can actually depress growth in your model. Uh, now, this is a partial equilibrium results, and you treat interest rate as exogenous. We know it is not exogenous mm -hmm. yeah. in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. In a growth model, low interest rate would be linked to low growth in itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my question is how your 
mechanism would change, mm -hmm. if any, the relation between interest rate and growth in, in a general equilibrium model. Mm -hmm. Could you have, uh, I don't know, yes. maybe multiple equilibria or something? Yes. Uh, because otherwise, it's difficult to see what is the policy yeah. implication. Yeah. Uh, my, I don't know whether I can ask a second question. Uh, yeah, my second question is, on policy, you mentioned government uh, subsidies. Uh -huh. But you also mentioned that this has very demanding information requirements. Yeah. Uh, so why not considering direct uh, public intervention or uh, if there is such a market failure in financing investment, public institutions taking care of financing mm -hmm. uh, long-term in investment for development. Okay. This yeah. my question. Yeah, that's both are very important questions. And uh, yes, uh, in order to uh, look at the interest rate effect, we did uh, small open economy uh, situations so that the real interest rate is exogenous, and uh, we. What we did is uh, interest rate drops, uh, and that will what happened to the investment and growth. And uh, your intuition is correct. Actually, the, when we have a closed economy, and the interest rate itself is endogenous variable, especially depend upon growth rate. And uh, you can have a multiple equilibria. So because of the low interest rate and the high the borrowing capacity failed to catch up the high investment cost. Investment is low. Because of low investment, inter equilibrium interest rate is low. And while, so you have a kind of trap-like uh, situations. And we haven't done complete analysis of uh, this closed economy version. But yes, your intuition is correct. Like, uh, we can have a. Uh, multiple equilibria like situation, like a normal interest rate, normal growth. That's one equilibrium. The other is the low interest rate and the, the low investment and low growth. And you can have a both, yes. And the second question in terms of the policy uh, implication, actually, it's not easy to do the government dialect because of the government do it and uh, they might lose money. So, so in this sense, the, this is constraint efficient, actually, uh, because of the engineer is the, uh, can move around, <laughs> and the engineer don't uh, provide the maintenance service or invest, uh, intangible investment unless get paid every period. This is the best we can do. But the, the government, the policy we propose is actually government is so big they can influence the wage rate or the reward rate engineer receive. Basically, the, the cost to the plant owner to hire is the same, but the, because of tax, engineer's receipt is going down. And uh, by changing the price, <laughs> the government can influence the investment. But the direct uh, uh, intervention requires extra leverage, which the private owner doesn't have. And uh, so you, you, you have to think about the government can chase the engineer directly or not. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we take the position even government cannot do. Only things government can do is chase the plant owner and then chase the plant owner's uh, payroll. <laughs> and uh, that's the policy we, we thought. Allow me to follow up a second to the question of Eugenio, which is, if we look at the COVID crisis, yeah. one policy that government did, in particular in Europe, mm -hmm. is loan guarantees, yeah. which yeah. are a sort of subsidies mm -hmm. in a way. So yeah. how sh and, and the effect of this use of this policy was actually to increase the horizon of credit. Mm -hmm. yeah. so now we have longer term credit relative to before. Mm -hmm. So how should we read these loan guarantees yeah. within your yeah. loan guarantee. So the, if the government is willing to spend money, <laughs> like uh, instead of balanced budget, we are talking about here. Yes, the government can do uh, the stimulating investment. But then, at some point, the government have to pay this uh, the extra cost. And uh, so, so you don't have a balanced budget or 
and uh, we have to take account. Yes, COVID case is an uh, unusual situation, therefore there is a reason to have a deficit uh, to give the subsidy. But in the long run, <laughs> balance, you have to pay for this. And uh, how do you pay? And, uh, and uh, what we did was uh, paying by payroll tax. <laughs> and it's not the payroll tax for regular worker. This is a payroll tax for the key personnel, like uh, engineers or managers or that, that sort of people. Yes. Federic? As I understand it, the, the, the theory hinges on the fact that both the engineer and the lender actually uh, get paid by a uh, share, share of revenues. Sure. Yes. Um, now, the lenders are actually not lenders in this, in this mm -hmm. respect. They are yeah. owners, as you Owner. explained. Yeah. You, you treat the lenders as owners based yeah. on the fact that in yeah. case of default, the, the lender becomes yeah. the residual owner mm -hmm. and uh, gets residual rights. Yeah. Uh, however, in, in your model, there is no uncertainty, No. Is, if I'm correct. Yeah. If there is no uncertainty, it is not clear that uh, you have, I mean, in, in the real world, there is uncertainty, and that's the reason yeah. why that you have uh, lenders mm -hmm. and owners as distinct that mm -hmm. you have di different contracts, yeah. different yeah. ways of financing yeah. an enterprise. And uh, um, I, I wonder whether this, this fact, this um, mm -hmm. uh, added touch of realism, mm -hmm. so to yeah. speak, yeah. adding, adding yeah. Uh, yeah. adding um, uncertainty on yeah. the one hand mm -hmm. and adding um, the diversity, the differentiated mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, financing contracts yeah. Yeah. may change the picture mm -hmm. somewhat. Yeah. Yes, that's, and uh, the reason we ignore the uncertainty is try to focus on the credit horizons, but, and uh, at the same time, we put the equity finance as a benchmark. So, so here the basic philosophy is uh, uh, plant, you can sell. <laughs> so when the engineer builds a plant, as well as the acquire the human capital to maintain the plant, they can, they can borrow 100% against the plant, or they can sell the plant actually, while the, uh, the human capital they cannot sell. And uh, but so the equity finance is a baseline model, but uh, actually realism, as you said, is that debt finance is more uh, common than equity finance. And uh, if you have, think about the say Italian small business, actually the the owner actually own the business as well as they have a capacity to maintain the business. They are doing the engineering work as well as the owner work <laughs> together. And uh, in that case, actually the continuation value of owner is pretty high because of the, they almost get the entire present value of uh, revenue, like a Y, so social value. So, so they have an incentive to continue the business for a long time. At the same time, creditor, like a banker, think, Wait a minute, they might, if they have a default, like a uncertainty we didn't have right now, but if you have a idiosyncratic uncertainty and the, they have a contingency of the default, then the like a creditor will take over the business. And at that point, actually the, the banker think, wait a minute, uh, this business, uh, the con in order to continue, I, the creditor have the banker have to pay a lot <laughs> to the the business small business owner to keep maintaining, and uh, they find it's not worth continuing. Actually, liquidation <laughs> of business is better. If you have such situation, actually the banker is lending not against the future cash flow, but against the asset. And uh, so, so the, if you have a situation like an owner and the owner engineer together, <laughs> they have an incentive to continue the business because of the, the building value. The continuation value is bigger than building value. But the, for when the default happens, 
the, the bank has thought, in order to continue, we have to keep paying to the, this uh, engineer or the old business owner, then they might liquidate. So, so this kind of situation can happen. And, uh, and uh, that's maybe the reason a uh, situation like Italy or Japan, like uh, borrowing against uh, uh, asset is common. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, so we don't have an uncertainty, but uh, it will change. But uh, still the credit horizon consideration will be relevant. <laughs> so so the, we don't, haven't done the homework to answer your questions, but uh, we have some conjectures uh, which actually the borrowing against the asset may be equivalent outcome in that kind of situation. Yeah, there are questions from the web. Thank you. I will read a question from Marco Albori. Do you have any evidence that the cash flow based lending is becoming a common phenomenon and could be generalized to other advanced as well as emerging economies? I, yes. <laughs> I'm not the uh, data person, but the cash flow based uh, borrowing is getting bigger and bigger. And uh, also the intangible uh, industries, like uh, the intangible investment intensive industries, actually the uh, cash flow is the more common way of borrowing because of they don't have much tangible assets like uh, Microsoft and uh, all these people. They, 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 don't, they hardly have uh, much tangible assets. Almost everything is intangible. And the intangible, in order to maintain the profitability, you have to keep, keep uh, investing. <laughs> like uh, thousands of software engineers have to keep working hard <laughs> and to maintain the productivity. And even if software engineer can move around, <laughs> you need that them to keep up with the, uh, keep the profitability of the business. So I think it's true. And, uh, I, I, I think empirically uh, we can find the evidence the cash flow borrowing become more and more important. Uh, uh, and, yes. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So we have a second question from Fabrizio Ferriani. A more common view on why low R can be bad for growth is that it causes misallocation of resources. The funds go to bad or unproductive firms. Is your mechanism an alternative to this view or a complement in the sense that could work in the same direction? Thank you. I think, yes, the, there is a literature and uh, so lower interest rate actually the exaggerate the misallocation of the capital stock and and uh, uh, ours is complement to this and uh, here even homogeneous producers actually the investment the lower interest rate the borrowing capacity fail to catch up with rising uh, investment cost the investment can drop so but the, it is the complement mechanisms, yes. Did you have another one or? No, it's okay. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> obviously we have to study it now <laughs> and perhaps uh, understand how it can be extended to the various mm -hmm. yeah. uh, real <coughs> states of the world. Uh, I have a, a very Naive question. Uh, how far is this from uh, the old Keynesian story that investment determines output and employment, and when the marginal efficiency of capital goes down, mm -hmm. then you either start reducing monetary interest rates, mm -hmm. or when you are at the <clears throat> zero lower bound, start mm -hmm. giving subsidies to the economy. Mm -hmm. Is this a Keynesian story? It has a, so here the it's more like a, a 
story about intangible investment. And the intangible investment finance has a particular features. Like uh, in order to uh, this uh, business keep going, you need to pay to the key personnel every period. And because of that, the financier, external financier, cannot rely too much distant uh, revenue. You have to rely on relatively new, near term, near future revenue uh, to lend. And uh, that creates the financing constraint. Here, and uh, beyond that, the marginal productivity itself is declining, is what you are talking about. And uh, uh, perhaps the, it might be related to the first questions. When growth rate goes down, actually the marginal product itself starts going down. And you might stuck into the situation Low interest rate create a situation that the investment cost is high relative to the borrowing capacity. At the same time, because of low investment, the growth is low, and that justifies the low interest rate. And uh, this kind of situation is the, the real danger. Like uh, Japan, for example, we hardly grow in last uh, 20 years nearly 30 years, actually. And uh, so we do have a situation like the trap into the low interest rate, low growth, uh, and a high, high, high investment cost in terms of the properties. So that, that kind of uh, the trap. And uh, yes, uh, I, how to get out from this trap is <laughs> Hard questions and uh, this kind of uh, tax on keepers, knows payroll. I'm not sure it it's too delicate. Maybe more direct one is the government is acting like a provider of the like a social overhead capital, like education or basic research or environment or something public goods, basically that may increase the marginal product of the private investment. That might be more direct than, yeah. Okay, we have a few more minutes, I understand. So let me ask maybe a question that is more coming from finance instead, which is if we look at ownership structure of yeah. corporate, yeah. there is a big variety. Not, I mean, it's not just debt and equity, but even within equity, we have mm -hmm. a short-term investor, we have a longer-term mm -hmm. investor. So how do I read this in the context of your framework? Yeah. And can I expect that in some industries, maybe it's the, it's the tangibility of investment mm -hmm. that determines the horizon of investor? Mm -hmm. Or how yeah. shall I think yeah. about it? I, I think my, I haven't done too much empirical work, of course, but uh, uh, one of the predictions is the shareholder, even outside shareholders or inside shareholders, they do care about the near-term revenue. And therefore, news about the near-term revenue affect the variation more than distance revenue. And I think we can look for the evidence to support that kind of things. Like, Aggregate uh, stock market, there is a literature like a near term gr earning growth is the more relevant to the stock market variation. This one is uh, not just aggregate, it's about the uh, individual company too. So, so I think there are some empirical uh, possibility like uh, people are overreacting to the uh, news about the near term revenue and uh, reacting to the long-term revenue. And uh, partly because of the owner don't get too much reward uh, in the distant future revenue because of the yeah, impact is declining over time. <laughs> so, so, yes. Okay, so let me then stop here. Thank you very much for this most interesting lecture and thank you for being here today again. Thank you very much.